Hello, this is Roger Bisbee from Skill Builder back with another Ask Skill Builder. If you don't know the format for this, it's simply that you send in the questions and we try and answer them. As I say, we, it's me sitting in front of a camera, but I do have contacts, I do have experts that I can call on if it's a specific problem like rising damp or whatever, uh, then hopefully we can find the answer. But anyway, let's get straight on with it and try and answer a few of these questions. We like you to send in videos if you can, if you can make a little video with your phone, that's fantastic because obviously YouTube is a movie medium, so it's much more entertaining for people. You don't have to be in them, by the way, if you're a bit camera shy or you'd rather just be anonymous, then just show us the problem and not your face. But it's always nice to see the people behind the problems, if you like, and get to know a few of our viewers as well. But anyway, let's get on with it. This is Roy Hansen. Now, Roy, he says his brother's in the trade. His brother's a bricky out on site, a uh, subby. He said they're building an extension here and he said that what they want is a bit of advice on how to put in the floor joists because he's not quite sure how to go about that. I think this must be a two-story extension that he's doing, so he's just looking, and he sent us a few pictures here. Okay, well, this is simple enough. I mean, there are two basic ways of, of putting joists into a building. You either use joist hangers, and in this case, it would be what they call a wood-to-brick joist hanger, Got great contact, by the way, Tico down in Port Slade on the south coast. So if you need any kind of products like that, Tico Building Products, good company. They make all these different joist hangers, so they'll be able to find you a really good, uh, what we call a wood to brick joist hanger. But there are also wood to wood ones that you can get. So if it's a timber frame or something, you might need one of those. But anyway, fairly self-explanatory things, the joist hangers, you build them in as you go and then you put the joists in. Now it's very important when you put the joists in that you make the joist the exact length. What you don't want is any bagginess in the joist. You don't want gaps behind the timber where it meets the joist hanger. The joist hanger has to sit hard back into the wall on both ends so we don't have any flexibility like this. And if you do that, all the load is a shear load. There's no opportunity for the joist hanger to, to cantilever, either to bend out and pull out from the joints. Very important that you get your tape measure out, you do a really good job of making a nice snug fit of those joists into those joist hangers. Some people don't like them because they're a little bit bouncy. Uh, if you jump up and down on the floor, you do get a little bit of bounce. So the other alternative is to build the joists in. Now some building inspectors like this, some don't. So you have to kind of work out who you're dealing with and ask that question. And if you do build them in, the very important thing to do is to make sure that the that, that you've made a good draft proof seal around the edges now you could do this with mastic if you use mortar to to pug them in if, if you like then the mortar will shrink away and you'll get a little air gap and then you get a draft coming through and sometimes that draft if that mortar cracks away and falls out that draft is quite considerable it's, it's running out of the cavity into the room and cooling the building down. So if you do build them in, you go around afterwards with the sealant or there is some other stuff called blower proof, which you paint on, which I use. You can also get a nice little socket that you put in. There's a plastic socket that goes into the wall and that's got a seal around it. So that draft proofs it. It protects the joist then from any rot and just makes a nice job of it. So thanks very much for sending those photographs in. It helps if we can see as much as possible of the job. Okay, this is just a quick one from Luke Oliver. He sent in a picture of some units he's just completed. He actually met us up at Tall Fair, had a chat with us, and he said he'd be pleased to be working on our team. And uh, if we've got any projects in the future or he's doing anything, then we might hook up with Luke. So yeah, I mean, this isn't a question as such, but we're very, very happy to link up with all kinds of people. If a good tradesman out there, if you've got an interesting project going on, you want us to come and have a look at it, provided it fits in our schedule and uh, geographically it's not too bad. You know, probably the Shetlands is not gonna happen, but uh, you know, we, we, we're happy to get out, we're happy to film things, and we're happy to a limited extent to come and look at uh, some of the problems that you've got. If we can get a channel sponsor for this particular strand, i.e. we can get a sponsor for Ask Skill Builder, that's gonna free us up a bit, and we might be able to move out on site a bit more and have a look at some problems firsthand and even help you out with them. So that would be good. That's a development, but first of all, we've got to get this thing rolling. So thanks, Luke. 
Okay, the next little problemette, if you like, is from Cassian Cappuccino. Well, I say problemette, it's actually probably quite a large problem. Now, Cassian is saying that a few years ago, they had this bathroom done by a local tradesman and they've since lost contact with him. Now, <laughs> what that means, who knows, you know. Uh, it's hard to judge from our, our end exactly what goes on. Sometimes customers and tradesmen fall out. Sometimes they just get fed up with each other. Sometimes it's a problem over payment. I don't know, I'm not gonna judge this particular situation. You can see there's a bit of travertine tile there, which is a very soft limestone tile, and it's cracked away in certain places. Unfortunately, this is a problem. They're very, very fragile, travertine, and it's gotta be laid properly. And if you're laying it on timber, then there's a bit of an issue with that because if you get any kind of movement, you can get cracking and chipping. But this looks like it's got a few holes in it. You can actually fill travertine, so it's not that bad. You can get a filler for it and just, uh, it's like a cement based filler if you like, put that in and, and, and make some repairs to travertine. But of course it needs sealing as well. Quite honestly, it wouldn't be my first choice. I know it was very, very trendy for a while. People put it in kitchens, they put it in bathrooms, but it is high maintenance. If you want an easy life, then go for something like porcelain, which is very, very durable indeed. But anyway, probably a week's work to get that bathroom up and running and looking good. But he's saying he's on a tight budget. How to find someone that's reasonable? How to find somebody that's cheap? This is the age old problem, isn't it? Because, you know, I've got this thing that, that Obviously you do the job properly and doing the job properly is not cheap. You know, those two things are mutually exclusive, if you like. If you get a cheap job, you won't necessarily get a good one because plumbers, you know, like everybody else, they've got to earn a living. They're all busy. If a plumber turns up, you should be worried because it means he hasn't got any work. So it's kind of that thing of if you phone somebody up and they say, oh, I'm booked up for the next six months, then you think, well, he must be good or she must be good. And uh, if they're able to turn up the next week, then you should be slightly concerned about that. Obviously, what that means is that if you're in business and you've got all this work ahead of you, you start pricing the jobs higher and higher so that you get rid of some. And as every tradesman will tell you, they'll all testify to this, the jobs you don't want and you price high to get rid of, you end up getting. So it's a double-edged thing you think, oh no, I've got that job, I didn't want to do it. But then you think, well, I've put in loads of money for it, so I'm going to, at least I'm going to be paid well for doing it. So, so that's the nature of the game. I don't think there's any way around that, but it just goes to show he's had a job done. There's all kinds of problems. Walls aren't straight, there's cracks all over the place, tiles lifting up. So you've got to build a relationship with a local tradesperson and just just look after them, give them tea and biscuits, give them what they need and, um, and love them a little bit. And hopefully they'll love you. It doesn't always work out, but it's certainly, in my experience, been the way to go. So the next question we got is from Mark Hull. Now, Mark has sent us in a photograph of a crack or a couple of photographs of some cracks in his building. He said it's a solid wall. Unfortunately, Mark, he hadn't really sent us in enough photographs to be able to take a sort of a considered opinion on this one, but I'm gonna deal with it as a general point. You know, what we really needed to see is the outside of the building as well as the inside of the building, get some wider angles so that we could see the whole wall rather than just focusing on the, on the crack. Don't worry about sending too many photographs in. We can always delete them. These cracks, by the shape of them, look to me like shrinkage cracks. They look like the kind of thing that's gonna happen if somebody's built a wall out of something like air creep blocks and they've rendered over it or plastered over it. Now, the reason I say this, that they look like shrinkage cracks, is because if you've got subsidence, if you've got a building which is basically sinking into the ground, then the crack is likely to be thin at the bottom, narrow at the bottom, if you like, and wide at the top. It's, it's likely to taper. And the simple reason for that is that you've got a wall like this, and as the wall moves apart, the bottom bit is obviously going to be closer and the top bit and the more the, the, the walls, the more the foundations sink, the wider that crack is going to be at the top. So it comes down into a narrow point. So that is normally an indication that you've got some kind of movement. That's not always the case. Sometimes you get differential movement where some, one side of the building drops and then you can see a misalignment in the, in the brickwork or whatever. You can clearly see where one bit of it's dropped. But if you just look at that, you can see that this looks like a parallel crack going all the way down. And also the telltale bit is that little bit of a crack beside it because 
that suggests that it's trying to pull away. Now, this is a problem. This is a problem. I used to work for a bricklayer years ago and he said the worst thing that ever happened in the building industry was cement because all the time they were building with sand and lime, you didn't get these problems because sand and lime is a marvellous material and it just moves. So as the buildings move with the seasons, and they will because they, they, they dry out, they, they get wet, they, they move around, and even when they're built on clay, you're going to get that heave where the clay's wet and it swells and then it gets dry and it shrinks. I.e. last summer we had a massive dry spell, all the clay shrunk. So you've got ground movement, you've got things happening. Now, if you use a really strong cement, and a lot of people are hell-bent on this, they just put in the strongest cement they can get. So they do a sort of four to one mix or something like that. And what that means is that that's not going to move anywhere. So what's going to happen is that when the building wants to move, as it will, if it wants to shrink away a little bit, then it's going to open up a crack because it can't just move a little bit. If, if you think of a wall that's six meters long and it's moving over that six meters, if you were talking about a movement of five or 10 millimeters over six meters, you, you understand that you've just got a minute bit of movement all the way along the wall. And then as it you know shrinks back, if you like, or goes back, you've got that minute bit of movement being taken up. So it's a marvelous system having sand and lime because it just moves in and out, in and out, and you don't tend to get the cracks. But with cement, cement's very unforgiving, it's strong, and the stronger you make it, the worse the problem will be. So the worst thing you get with cracks is that they appear and people go, oh, there's a bit of a crack there, I better fill it in. Now, if it's something like clay heave and you've got this seasonal movement as, as the ground's got wet and it's got dry, imagine what happens if it dries out in the, in the warm weather and that crack opens up. You go and fill it up. And because you think, oh, it's a crack, I better fill it up with something really strong. I'm going to put some strong cement in here. So you make yourself up a three to one mix. And you put that filler or that cement in there. And then it starts to rain and the ground swells again. And that crack starts to close up. Now, if it closes up, it's kind of pushing against that hard material, that cement that you've made. And the cement's not going to go anywhere, it's, you know, you've made it strong. So what it's going to do is it's going to push the building apart a little bit more. And it's what they call ratcheting. It just opens, closes. Every time it opens, you put more filler in. Every time it closes, it pushes the brickwork apart a little bit more. So actually what you're doing by filling the crack is you're levering the building apart. And you do see this all the time. So the thing is, if you're gonna fill a crack, fill it with a flexible material, fill it with something that will give. And there are loads and loads of things around now. There are loads of mastics and all sorts of joints. Now, I had a house 35 years ago that I filled with a mastic joint, and then I just painted over, put some sand on the mastic uh, to make it look like the render, just flick sand on it, and then painted it over with a Santex paint. And you could hardly see it. In the, in the bright sunlight, you could just see it going down, but it didn't look bad. And I've been past that building several times since then, have a look at it, and that crack hasn't opened up. That's 30 years that that crack has been filled with that mastic, and it's been all right. So I reckon it's a pretty good system to use. So that would be my uh, solution to this. But what I'm saying, in this particular case, I think what's happened is that somebody's put some strong render on there, and it hasn't allowed the wall to move. So he's got a problem in as much as, if that's all it is, if it's a shrinkage crack, what I would do is just mastic it up and probably just not even bother finishing the mastic. Just put the mastic in proud, wait till it goes off and then get one of those polycell scraper blades, Stanley knife blade thing, and then just run it up the wall and slice the mastic off so that it makes a really clean, neat finish to it and then paint it over. And I think if you do that, you'll find that it's as good as you can get. You can use something like a flexible paint. And in the end, I guess it's down to that old thing of people doing this, papering over the cracks, as bad as it seems. When you're trying to sell a house, <laughs> that's what people do. Anyway, that's a good little question. But as I say, we could have done with some more photographs. Okay, this one's from Travers. Now, Travers has got a radiator. He wants to take that radiator out. He wants to join to the pipe and looking at the pipe, it's pretty horrible actually. It's 
it's all corroded. It's green, it's not necessarily the end of the world. It looks horrible because it's been buried in cement. Somebody's tried to wrap that with some hessian, which is a good thing, but it doesn't look particularly nice. If it were me, I would probably be chasing that screed back because the screed is only very, very thin over the top of that pipe. And I'd probably hack it back all the way along that floor and I would find somewhere else to connect to. And even if I was still connecting onto the copper pipe at another point, I would probably do it because that way round, you have put a piece of plastic pipe under that floor. Now plastic pipe, PEX pipe, is a lot better to bury in cement than, than copper pipe is. Copper pipe will corrode in cement. The acid in the cement eats into it, and I've been to countless jobs where it started leaking under the screed because people haven't protected it properly. So the best job would be to hack that up and, and join back to the, the pipe somewhere else, preferably outside of the floor if you can, and just run a new bit of pipe in in, uh, in 15 mil PEX pipe, if you like. Or you could even go down to 10 mil if you're just looking for one connection to a radiator. But if not, if what you wanna do is join to that pipe, then you need to get off that bend and you need to just go back a little bit, cut the pipe, and you've gotta suck the water out. He's concerned about sucking the water out. He's saying, uh, if I solder, there's no drain off cock there. Well. The, the key to it is to get yourself a wet and dry vacuum cleaner, suck that pipe dry because you can't solder, as he knows, you can't solder a wet pipe. So if there's any water in there and you try to solder, it will spoil the joint. You'll get steam coming out and the steam will blow through the solder and uh, it will be game over. So you need to get that. I would use solder. I wouldn't use a compression fitting or a push fit fitting under that if you're gonna bury it, if you're gonna put some cement back over, you need to have a proper solder joint there. But as I say, my solution would be to go back to something decent. I don't think if I was doing that as a job for somebody, I would, I would do that. I would say to them, look, I'm not willing to put my name to this. I'm gonna go back to something decent. So it's not the end of the world to have to put a new bit of screed across there. You can get a bit of self level or something and just plug it in. So if you're gonna do that much, you might as well do that much. <laughs> That's my solution. So this question's from Shane, and Shane wants to have an extension built, and he's sent us in the drawings here. You can just see them, they're, they're kind of photographed, so uh, you'll have to forgive him if they're not, at all. forgive us if they're not particularly good, but from what I can see, you know, it's pretty standard extension here, and he's saying that the quotes he's received so far have been absolutely ridiculous. Even to do the brickwork, it's a lot of money. So he's wondering how he can save some money. Well. If, if, if the brickwork, I mean, let, let me just say, my brickie, who's a very good brickie, he charges me probably now, I was just saying last year, he was charging me 220 pounds a day. He's probably gone up from that. So, you know, he, he wants over a thousand pounds a week and you think, oh, oh goodness, that's a lot of money. But actually it's not because he does a lot of work in a day. He does first class work. You don't have to have it redone. It's a great job. And uh, I think that, you know, he's worth that money because you think about it, he's got to run a van, he's got to run his business, he gets rainy days, he gets all kinds of aggro. So he's not earning 220 pounds a day every day, you know, all, all year round. He's, he's, you know, when he's working, he's earning that kind of money. But I think possibly, you know, 250 pounds a day would not be unreasonable for a bricklayer. Now, the other way you can have it done is you can just get a price based on square meterage. So you can get your local sort of square meterage rates just by phoning a few guys up and saying to them how much delay face brick work, square meter, you know, if they're doing cavity work or whatever. So it's very easy to get a few prices, but what I'm saying is don't think that you're gonna get this job done for nothing. If you want an extension, it's not gonna be cheap because that's the way it is. I mean, my bricky was saying to me that he built an extension for himself, which is a wraparound extension, if you like, a bit along the side and a bit around the back. And he did his own job, and it ended up costing him £70,000, and he was providing free labour. So even on that basis, you can see that it can cost you a lot of money to have an extension built. The good news is, if you have it built properly, if you get a good job, then, you know, we've got all these questions coming in from people who haven't had a good job. But if you think, okay, I'm going to go to someone that's been recommended, just ask a few friends and, and neighbours, if you see a job, when you're driving past, you see a job, you think, oh, that looks like a nice job. Stop, have a chat with a brickie. 
get him to give you a quote. But try, don't try to save money on that bit. You can save money if you dig the foundations. He said that you can do, he can do the electrics himself. So certainly if you dig the foundations, if you take care of all the muck and all the, all the rubbish jobs like that, then you can save yourself some money. You can save yourself some money on the, on the dry lining, for example. Dry lining's not a difficult job, plasterboarding the whole rim out, and there's plenty of videos on YouTube showing you how to do that kind of thing. Probably if you're having an extension plastered and you've never plastered, you don't want to be plastering it yourself, get your plaster in. We've got videos on plastering and they're really to show you how to do bits and pieces, but I wouldn't attempt to do a whole room, even though actually I did quite a lot of this one, but um, it's, uh, it's one of those jobs, you know, that you're probably not gonna save much on. But certainly, I mean, the, the beauty of YouTube is you can go onto YouTube, you can watch all kinds of instructional videos on all kinds of things and work out what you're capable of. If it's a kitchen extension, then fitting kitchen units is not that difficult to do especially if you get somebody in to cut the worktops, there are specialists who will come in and just cut your worktops in for you. So if you're only talking about putting units together or screwing units together and attaching them to the wall, not that difficult. But um, again, just have a look at some videos on it and see what you think. But uh, as I say, probably if you think you're gonna get away with this cheaply, you're not. Sorry to say that, but I think that's, that's a realistic answer building is expensive. The good news is that you're not really spending the money, you're putting the money into store because it's like putting it in the bank. You know, in, in most parts of the country, not everywhere, but in most parts of the country, there's been a steady increase in property prices over the years, and any money you spend on a property, you will eventually recoup if it's done properly. If it's not, if you spend money on a property and all you've got is a load of trouble that's gotta be redone, then you have wasted your money. You've spent your money and you won't get it back. But investing in good quality work and materials is the best way to secure your investment, if you like, and make sure that eventually, eventually like me, you know, when you get to retirement age, you've got something to sell and uh, you can downsize hopefully then and uh, cash in. Anyway, I'm Roger Bisbee. Thanks very much for sending those questions in. That was a nice little crop of questions we got from this week so let's hope we get more of those and let's hope uh, we can continue doing ask skill builder if you're not a subscriber please become a subscriber because we love to see this channel grow we need subscribers we need views we need help we need sponsors we need everything <laughs>